So welcome to my talk, uh, Consequential Closure Architectures. Uh, and if that sounds like a marketing term to you, then it maybe kind of is. So I will get to that in a second. But first, a little bit about me. Um, my name's Janet, Janet Carr, and I am an independent closure consultant. So no shilling here in this talk. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Kanakistan. Of uh, Canada, and <laughs> I have years of professional closure experience and other things uh, like DevOps, SRE, that kind of stuff. I have a blog um, where I talk about architecture and design and closure, uh, lots of closure stuff over there, and all kinds of other silly stuff. And yeah, I have a Twitter where I tweet pictures of closure code like every day. I'm a little obsessed. Okay, so what the heck does this mean, right? Uh, oops. Yeah, so a consequential closure architecture is a closure based system design and architecture that has negative or undesirable impact. So this is really a metaphor or copy for <laughs> like an anti-pattern. Um, and I have seen a lot of them over the years and I want to share them all with you. And then at the end of the talk, I will talk about some architecture, I think small wins or like small effort that could potentially be big wins near the end. So if you're here, it's, you're probably experiencing some of these symptoms. You hear the word refactoring a lot in your stand-ups. Surprise errors or values in your code. You know, too many functions to keep track of in your head. Um, and for those of you that don't know, there's too many functions in your head. Uh, we typically, or I like to think of it as uh, something called cyclomatic complexity. Um, attempts at organization are met with keep it simple. Uh, how, many, how many of you have had this happen at your closure, closure shop? Really? Okay, a few hands, that's good. Don't leave me hanging. Um, yeah, and so, or often you get opinion stalemate, like during your pull request or whatever. So since architecture is like this super contentious topic, I just wanna cover a slide about how I think about architecture, software architecture. Uh, first of all, I wanna say it's not an OOP thing, object-oriented programming thing. Um, even if it was, we can still learn from it. So in that sense, um, architecture, I think, follows from requirements engineering, you know, typical software engineering stuff. Uh, requirements engineering follows from market demand, which means your software architecture should be able to respond to changes in the market. And then my kind of hot take is that uh, architecture is this business solution, and that solution scale, not programming languages. Okay, so what is it already? Um, we can think of software architecture as putting our distinct domains into these blocks. Uh, quite literally blocks on a diagram as components. And then the way those components interact with each other and the rest of the world, we just have connectors, uh, probably lines, if you've ever seen a diagram before, which I'm sure most of you have. All right. So we all know that simple is hard, not easy, right? But I think in the early days, early code looks simple, but it's actually easy. Um, and so I think a lot of code enters the code base 
under the guise of keep it simple. And this kind of sets the standard for the code base that slowly gets out of control. Uh, we kind of, well, we're not, we're, I think there's like not enough literature on software architecture in functional programming languages, which is why I'm up here. Um, yeah. And so what happens is we try to do these things for quick wins with our software uh, attempts at organizing, but usually these end up becoming like anti-patterns. And so, uh, yeah, I hope that we can identify these anti-patterns and I'm gonna go through some of them and they'll make our lives easier, I hope. And then of course, we can design architecture patterns to solve our problems. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, uh, yeah, I bet some of you have probably worked on a code base that maybe kind of feels like this. We have our reframe front end and our HTTP magic and our ring back end, um, which is composed of a lot of spaghetti. And then, some kind of database, if you're lucky, it's like XTDB or Datomic. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna cover the anti-patterns. I want everybody to know that I am 100% guilty of all of these anti-patterns. So, if, you know, I have, I have clients and deadlines, like I have clients to keep happy, so uh, I'm 100% guilty of all these. I don't want people to feel bad. Like if you've ever done that, you're like, oh, this feels so bad. It's like, don't worry about it. I just, it's just so that, you know, we can all like hopefully build better software. Okay, so the first anti-pattern, this is one that I see a lot in closure code bases. Um, Essentially, it's we're going to put all of our technical or business domain into a single namespace. And I'm talking like 5,000 lines of code, like a huge namespace. And the problem with this is uh, it creates information overload and reluctance to find the function for the task. Uh, yeah, and so like, that, that kind of leads to people creating more code, because people don't want to search for the code that they need, so they end up rewriting it. And I've seen this time and time again. This is probably, that, the reason this is the first one here uh, is because I've seen this the most. And then of course, because we have multiple functions that do the same thing, we get a lot of cyclomatic complexity, duplicate code, that kind of thing becomes a night maintenance nightmare. So the solution that I usually like to think of for this is to structure in namespaces and folders uh, almost in a like business domain by technical domain kind of matrix. And so as a developer is going through the folder structure, they can just find what they're looking for by browsing through the folders, or you know, in your Emacs like mini buffer, if you're like me. Uh, this is going to be kind of a code-heavy talk as well. I don't, obviously, I don't, I don't have uh, an example for this one because it, it wouldn't even like fit on the screen. So um, we're just going to not. But you can imagine, like. So thousands of lines of code, uh, not very, not very happy. So the next one, the next anti-pattern I like to call is haphazard handler. And this is the locality, the problem that is trying to be solved is the locality of the business logic to the API or the inputs of the system. So usually the handler, you know, if we have Composure or Retit, usually the, the handler is just a higher order function, uh, which is good because it decouples, it in theory decouples the handler from the route, 
uh, but it's not usually dynamic. You can't you know, programmatically switch that out. And then, yeah, the business logic is also often part of the handler. So this is kind of like multifaceted. Uh, and then it becomes very hard to version your API or to like separate out the business logic from it. And so eventually what happens is you might end up having just create whole new API specs along with the handlers to go with that. Yeah, and so uh, the solution I like to use for this is to separate and decouple the business logic from the handler, uh, either by like with the handler closing over the business logic, like using a higher order function, or I don't know, a protocol. If you really hate protocols, maybe use a multi-method. There's some kind of dispatch <clears throat> so obviously there's a lot wrong with this code. Hard-coded parameters, no exception handling. Um, so how do you like that? Um, but the important thing is that the, the business logic for our shipping tax handler, shipping, shipping tax? Yeah, shipping tax lives in the handler code. Ideally, we would only have the HTTP stuff in the handler uh, and send the business logic off to some some other function or delegate or whatever you want to call it. Yeah, so this is another pattern that I see a lot in closure code bases, anti-pattern. <clears throat> I call it wishful typing. So the problem that is trying to, people are trying to solve here is people want to know what the function inputs and outputs are. And usually if you come from a statically typed programming language, that is the compiler helping you with this. Um, but typically, we don't have such a luxury in Clojure. Now, I, I, I do think there is a time and place to use Clojure spec, um, but using it excessively can make your code really, really rigid, um, and very, it can cause duplicate code. And of course, you have the whole wasting cycles on spec validators, like how, how deep do you go? Like is it, is it a collection of strings? Is it a collection of specific strings? Like it just, it, it can be a rabbit hole. I often don't think the reward is worth the effort when it comes to spec test generators. And of course, it, it actually discourages certain closure features. Uh, you know, for example, uh, like transducers or higher, some higher order functions like closures and stuff. Um, mostly because those things are context independent or ideally they would be as context independent as possible. But you kind of can't have, you, you lose some of that uh, independence by structuring the code so rigidly with lots and lots of spec. Um, and this is a really tough one to get out of because if you have it all over your code base, uh, it, it can, it's like, yeah, it can be fatal. So um, my approach, what I usually use spec or Molly for, uh, is for like system boundary stuff, you know, the API level or just like chorus inputs, stuff like that. And then I use really descriptive doc strings because um, we all love doc strings and we all write doc strings. And here's an example of what that looks like. Um, as you can see, this is a very, there's more spec here than code, and it's not really necessary. I know some of these examples are like kind of toy examples. I'm just trying to get across what, what I'm talking about. And so we have a ton of uh, spec defs at the top for like three functions. Um, So the, uh, I, I take it that some people already know what this is going to be about. Um, so I, I see this in a lot of like older open source code bases. Uh, I mean like, like Clojure 1.0 or like 1.2 or something like that. Um, so usually what this is is like trying to use Clojure as a direct replacement 
for Java. Uh, I'm sure we've all seen what that looks like. Uh, yeah, so ex excessive or near excessive use of interop, records, side effects, you know, all the like Java type stuff that we don't really, we don't, we don't want to be those people. We want, <laughs> we want to be, we want to be in the functional land. And of course, it also goes hand in hand with wishful typing because statically typed languages and stuff. And the real, the, the thing that's very frustrating about this is that it breaks the conventions of our functional programming code base. So, um, we can use function composition and reify anonymous types. And here is an example of what not to do. Especially this because the, the uh, what's it, the bivariate function, the, these interfaces that are being reified here uh, by def record are, they are, they already have implementations in Java land, so they don't even need to be used. You can just use straight interop here. This is kind of like the, the thing that, like, that makes it tough. Um, and yeah, okay, so next one is, I call this record relational mapping. Uh, and this is inversion control of the DB. Um, I'm, <laughs> I've seen this a couple times. Uh, and this is essentially trying to build an ORM with like records and protocols. Uh, and the protocols create rigidity. They, I like protocols. I, I think protocols are really just a bag of functions. Um, if anybody like follows me online, like they know how I think about that. Uh, but they're, they're hard to design. What we're really talking about is an interface. Uh, I mean, an interface is a bag of function signatures, right? And then, of course, it's hard to design a subsystem that covers all of the database's features. So really, what you should just do is use NextJDBC uh, and dispatch, uh, decouple it if you have to, uh, the multi-method or higher order function. And then, yeah, and so we have, we have our DB entity and our def record, our record user here, uh, and all these functions that don't really work very well. Um, and I, like I've seen, I, I had someone tip me off that uh, their, their employer takes this to the extreme where they actually have a special protocol that serializes their thing to transit and so that they can they can um, just send all, just have all their crud that way, except what happens is their code base is like, you know, 100,000 lines of code, and then their REPL, it takes like minutes for a REPL evaluation, so. Uh. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so the next section is you know, to fulfill my obligations under the, <laughs> the talk proposal. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about some software architecture patterns. If, there's a couple that I think are, that have little investment for potentially outsized gains. <laughs> okay, so I know, I know for some of you this is probably an anti-pattern itself. Uh, and that's okay, I wanted to bring it up because this, the model view controller is taught in just about every computer science program in like the world, right? It's, this is like the classic architectural pattern. And we, we can build this with a th like three, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, we can build this with three classic gang of four design patterns. So if you, if you don't know what model view controller is, it is essentially, a classic pattern to decouple state, state changes, and state usage. And then we can use a strategy, an observer, and a composite to achieve this. Because I have them in the brackets there, in the, in the comments. Um, and so the way I like to think about this is 
When it comes to the classic Gang of Four design patterns, or really any design pattern, uh, a design pattern is almost like your, your programming language lacks a feature. And so we can achieve a lot of this in Clojure using higher order functions as like delegates, and even we have watches, which are quite literally observers, and then uh, like some kind of component library, which gives us the composite pattern. And I know exactly what you're thinking right now. <laughs> so let's let's build. Let's look at a like really contrived example, I guess. Uh, this is a super important positive integer adder. Uh, we can think of the controller as our strategy, and so we have a couple higher order functions. These are our strategy delegates, which means that uh, some other part of the program will delegate its decision on changing the display and solving our adder to these functions. Now I know it's not exactly a great idea to close over state, um, but this, this is just an example, so. Yeah, and so the view, this is pretty straightforward. This is just Seesaw components. Um, it's a view hierarchy. Uh, Seesaw, if you don't know, it's, um, it's like a, a functional wrapper around s Java swing components. And then that gives us our UI. This is, uh, our view hierarchy, as you can see, we create all the interface buttons and then we attach it to the frame. Uh, the frame, this is gonna be kind of important for how state changes are modeled, so just keep that in mind. I wish I could have fit all of them on here, but then I don't know if, if people would have been able to read the code, so. Yeah, so the model is really just, uh, an atom, just have an atom, and then we want to observe that atom, we use a watch to do that, and we use the watch function to change the view hierarchy in response to the atom change, state change. And I threw in a logger there, just, just for like ease of development. But we, we, could do, we could do anything, like we could do a lot here, right? Now that we decoupled them, we could, we could add as many watches as we want. We could add a scientific button very easily to this, which is add a watch function, and then we will get, we can have like, you know, a scientific adder. <laughs> but what, what we're doing is just rebuilding the view here. Uh, and yeah, so, and then we could even change the strategies that we use as well. Uh, that we delegate to, and so we could, we could just change the behavior. We could make this a negative integer adder. Of course, it wouldn't be very useful, but. Um, yeah, so I, I think that uh, recently ports and adapters architecture, hexagonal architecture, gets thrown around a lot on the internet. Uh, essentially, it decouples inputs from business logic and from outputs. And this implies a unidirectional flow of information. Uh, so that's, that's kind of like you know, a REST handler into your core function and then to, into a database insert, the kind of stuff I was talking about with like the haphazard handler. Uh, ports in this sense literally mean interfaces um, and adapters in the sense, mean adapter-ish pattern, because this is closure. Uh, and so the adapters are split into two different types. We have driving adapters and driven adapters. So driving adapters decouple the system inputs from the business logic, and then we ha and then the driven adapters decouple the business logic from the system outputs, so like 
Uh, driven adapters quite literally wrap external libraries or services um, like your database or I don't know, your, your Sentry or some logging service or whatever it might be, Kafka, um, RabbitMQ. And then, yeah, I already said this, but driving adapters wrap the business logic or core APIs. Um, yeah, so some of the benefits of this, good separation of concerns, great for mocking dependencies in tests, like really, really good for this. Uh, caveats though is designing interfaces is hard, really hard. Um, and it can often introduce a certain type of rigidity that you might not expect. And then of course, driven adapters often hide or encourage side effects, um, like databases. So this is kind of like the most generic like diagram that I can write of this, and this is like with, yes, I'm using, I'm sorry, I used a little bit of UML here, don't, don't freak out, but um, we have like uh, our external driver expects an interface that is implemented by the driving adapter, and then that wraps the application logic, and then the application logic expects uh, interfaces that the driven adapters implement, and they wrap external services. So when I say uh, external service library, I mean like uh, any library. I don't know, send, send grid, send grids like, or you know, Stripe's closure library, or whatever it is, any, any external library. And I can tell by the look on some people's faces. <laughs> uh, okay, then maybe so, maybe we won't need it. Uh, but this, this is like a con almost like a contrived example. So uh, our ports do not have to be in protocols. They could be just higher order functions. Uh, as we can see that the, the handler closes over uh, biz logic function, and that this biz logic function is our, um, our port. And when we construct this, we just pass in our process string adapter, which does the very important job of wrapping our string reverse. <laughs> our, um, and then process string, this is our application core. This, close, this takes, uh, it could close over it if you wanted it to, but it, it takes a logging function as its port, so to speak, and the, the adapter for that is the capture exception adapter at the top, and this just converts the exception type into something that Sentry would like uh, instead of throwable, because you need a map. Yeah, and of course, you could, you could have multi-methods here too as well. I like, um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately, um, and that like, you don't have to pass anything with multi-methods, so that's kind of like a nice benefit. Uh, yeah, and so finally, on, on this, we, this is just like typical architecture diagram stuff. Yeah, uh, so Polylith, this is probably the closest thing to ports and adapters architecture, the closest analog anyways. Um, it promotes good things with reusable components uh, called bricks. And then we organize, it organizes those bricks into components and bases and workspaces uh, and we have our reusable bricks of functionality, components, bases, our application or library foundations, and then workspaces, top level organization structure. Uh, and it comes with a nice little toolkit to manage all three of those, uh, even though I don't use it. <laughs> so this is kind of a popular approach in the clean coders 
realm of things. Uh, it's similar to ports and adapters because we're separating domains, uh, except we have really four, four domains, uh, four technical domains, so to speak. We have our domain model, and this is kind of like our, almost like a data model in a sense. Uh, we have a repository which accesses that domain model, and we have our services layer, which is where our application logic goes, and then we have our API. And so this lets us have a dependency-free domain layer, um, and which is great because it's easier to test and it takes it's less, less headaches, less side effects. Yeah, and so this approach is also a pretty good candidate for higher order functions. Um, it's, it is, I do think that this approach is a little more geared towards protocols or like interfaces in general rather than higher order functions. But like, I mean, what is a higher order function if not a protocol with like one, one function in it, right? Um, and so, or you could use multi-methods, but I think for this example that I'm gonna show, we're just gonna have like the three, three or four functions here. Uh, yeah, and so our service function, fetch product, really important. Um, obviously your services and your repositories in the real world would be a lot more complex. And the model doesn't, the model doesn't have to be a record domain model. Um, this could be a map, could be a function. Of course, the domain has no dependencies, which is nice. And these three things, two things. Um, uh, microservices are kind of not, not nearly as in favor as they used to be. But I find, and Maybe some of you agree that closure kind of lends itself nicely to many small code bases, or just small code bases in general. And so we can use hexagonal architecture, ports and adapters, or Onion, uh, to help transition to microservices. Uh, this is called a strangler pattern for, it's not a very good name, but uh, for those of the, you that are interested. And this gives us dependency inversion. Um, so we can decouple things and, yeah, and then we can swap out our dependencies for scalability and make our software web scale. Okay, do we, I think we have time for questions.